All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Alliance Mentronic Seminar number 99. Um, today's speaker is um, Peter Opener, who is a professor of theoretical condensed matter physics at Uppsala University in Sweden. His research is focused on theoretical magnetism, ultrafast magnetic processes, current and light induced magnetization control, magnetic spectroscopy, and superconductivity. Dr. Openair graduated from Utrecht University in 1983 and earned his PhD degree in theoretical condensed matter physics at the Free University Amsterdam in 1987. He then held positions as a postdoc at Darmstadt University from 1988 to 1992 and a staff researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden from 92 to 97. He was then a habilitant and then a, a docent at the Technical University Dresden from 97 till 2004, which is when he moved to Uppsala. Uh, Dr. Opener's H index is 66, has about 16,000 citations. And uh, his uh, presentation today will be on ab initio theory of magnetic spin and orbital hall and nearest effects in metallic ferromagnets. Uh, please, Peter, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Kirill, and uh, Xin Fan. Thank you for the kind invitation to this uh, online Spintronic seminar. I want to talk about recent work that we have done. It is uh, ab initio theory for uh, what we call magnetic spin and orbital hall effect, and also Nernst effect in metallic uh, ferromagnets. Now I have to see if this. One of them is working. Okay. We have to see. Oh, okay. Now it is works. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, the motivation uh, is uh, for this work is uh, spin orbit torques, um, and uh, we very well know all this uh, work that was done now more than 10 years ago, where it was shown that uh, you can switch magnetization uh, with spin orbit torques in, uh, in um, a cobalt platinum bilayer system, just using uh, currents. And you get a very nice switching due to spin orbit torques as was shown in these uh, two seminal papers. Uh, and then after this, uh, a few years later, it was shown that you can also have staggered spin orbit torques in uh, special antiferromagnets such as uh, copper manganese arsenide or manganese to gold. Uh, and there are staggered spin orbit torques in these materials as was uh, shown in this work by Zelesny et al. And then uh, the actual uh, switching was shown in the science paper of uh, Wadley et al. So these are uh, spin orbit torques. Uh, they have been uh, discussed quite a lot in the literature. Um, the origin of the spin orbit torque is uh, charged to spin conversion um, due to the spin hall effect, uh, as is by now well known. Uh, so proposed by Diakonov and Perel, and uh, Hirsch gave it the name spin hall effect. What we have is that there is a charge current. Uh, and then um, due to the relativistic spin orbit interaction, there is will be a transverse spin current and a spin accumulation on the sides of the material. This is a transport property that can be described by the spin conductivity tensor. Uh, but there is also an other effect, which is a, a local effect. This is uh, the Raspa Edelstein effect, or also called inverse spin galvanic effect. Uh, what happens here is that we need an, uh, a symmetry breaking, and then we have a current or an applied electric field, and then locally in the material, a spin polarization arises. And uh, that can be described also in a uh, response formulation here, electric field, and then there is a spin susceptibility tensor and the uh, induced um, spin polarization. So this was... Uh, originally proposed by Edelstein on the basis of um, uh, Rajpa spin orbit uh, interaction. Uh, this, these two effects, they are actually time reversal even. That is going to be important in the rest of the talk. So we have 
uh, this uh, spin conducti the conductivity tensor element, time reversal even, and this susceptibility also time reversal even. Now, um, in the last years, there have been observations of unusual spin orbitals. Okay, so one of the first works was by Xin Fan and co-workers in this uh, nature communication where they showed there are uh, spin orbit effects with spin rotation symmetry. And this is one of the plots from uh, their paper. There is actually an unusual direction of the induced spin polarization. And then there were other works uh, like this uh, by Satoshi Ihama. Uh, they call an effect spin anomalous hole effect. So this actually is also mag strongly magnetization dependent. Uh, in another work uh, by Gibbons et al., uh, they report a spin current due to the anomalous hole effect. Uh, so also depending on the magnetization. Uh, and then the effect, the, um, the name uh, magnetic spin hole effect appeared in this nature paper, uh, where actually an unusual antiferromagnet is uh, investigated. But the important point is that uh, it is a time odd effect. So it is not time even, but time odd. And then uh, last year, the Cispedes uh, and Barocal et al., they, uh, they uh, introduced spin anomalous hole effect for a single uh, gadolinium iron cobalt layer. Where, when you look at the plot here, there is again an, an unusual direction of the spin polarization. So a, a review, recent review on this was... Uh, given by Davidson et al. So one of the main questions is that we, but I want to try to address is what is the origin uh, of these effects? And actually we have to say, this is not a complete list. Okay, so there were more observations um, and there have also been discussions about this in the literature. Uh, so we want to try to look what we can understand from up initial calculations soon. Uh, there were also several other uh, remarkable predictions, I have to say. Uh, so apart from the spin hole effect, there is also the orbital hole effect that was predicted in, in these two uh, papers here, Tanaka et al. and Kontani et al. Uh, so there would be just like there is a spin current, there would be an orbital current. And this idea was worked out further by uh, uh, Go et al. in this PRL 2018, where they showed that you can have a transfer, transverse uh, orbital current, just as you have a spin current. And the, it is due to an orbital texture that you can have in, in K space. And, and a recent actually uh, review where also Matthias Kloy was involved uh, is this EPL from, from uh, um, last year. Uh, we introduced actually a kind of a different effect to which I will come later on. This is the orbital Raspar Edelstein effect. So in the same way that you have the spin Raspar Edelstein effect, you can have the orbital Raspar Edelstein effect. So I want to talk about our recent work on Epsinicio theory for magnetic spin and orbital Hall effect in ferromagnets, and then move on to um, spin and orbital accumulation in uh, platinum 3D bilayers, and also discuss uh, uh, spin and orbital Rosberg edelstein effects in symmetry-broken antiferromagnets. And I have to mention that this work was uh, done by several people in my group here. Actually, Leandro Salemi, he, he got his PhD last week. He was the one who did uh, most of the work, and also a previous postdoc, uh, Marco Barita and Ashish Nandi. Okay, let's go to the methodology that we are using. We want to do app initial calculations. So we can look at the equation for the Raspar Edelstein effect. This requires inversion symmetry breaking. So there is a, if we talk about an induced spin polarization, so there is a spin a magnetoelectric susceptibility that we have to calculate. And we can do the same thing if we go to an orbital polarization, we have an orbital magnetoelectric susceptibility. So we work out this in uh, linear response theory. We use uh, DFT, um, and this is the expression in linear response theory. Um, I will not go too much in the details here, but this, this uh, A here, this is a, a matrix element. This stands for the orbital angular momentum operator or the spin angular momentum operator. 
Um, and then we can calculate these susceptibilities. Okay, we have actually two terms. So there is one term, this is uh, the interband term or Fermi C term, and the other term here is intraband or Fermi surface. Uh, okay, so these equations, we worked those out in, in this um, paper here, and it was implemented in uh, relativistic mean 2K. So we have, if we have both components, we have the induced uh, local magnetization. Uh, this is not everything, because we also need the, the spin conductivity tensor. So we also, this is now a, a rank 3 tensor. Uh, but it is given by the same expression. We have uh, is now a spin current or an orbital current operator that we insert and we can work that out and calculate uh, the spin conductivity tensor or the, the orbital conductivity tensor. I have to mention here that uh, we include scattering effects in an average. It is uh, uh, this intraband uh, lifetime or the interband lifetime. We do not take into account uh, extrinsic effects such as uh, uh, sidestep or screw scattering. So they are not taken into account. Okay, so this formalism, basically it was for platinum, it was done by Goa et al. Uh, and uh, uh, for the orbital hole effect, uh, it was done by Tanaka et al. We can else also calculate spin and orbital Nernst effects. Um, they are given by a, a thermal gradient. So we have an additional term here. And then we can also calculate these uh, because they are given by the MOT expression where there is a derivative here of the uh, spin or orbital conductivity tensor. However, I will not say so much about spin and orbital Nernst effects, but you're welcome to ask me about it. Since there was an, uh, a few emails uh, before my talk about what is magnetic spin hole effect, I want to give just a short summary so that everyone is on the same page. Uh, so we can look, this is our material. We have the electric field here in the X direction, the spin current, for example, here in the Z direction, and then the induced uh, polarization, the, the the spin polarization is uh, in the y direction. So in the conventional spin hole effect, we have three quantities and they are all orthonormal and they are time reversal even or magnetization even. They are actually given by what is called the Fermi C or, or the interband term. Okay, and they are, can be calculated by expressions uh, for the spin Berry curvature as given here. Uh, so you see here, this is the, the, um, the interband or Fermi C term. Okay, so this we know, um, sorry. We want to look at something else. We want to look at an anomalous component. Uh, and that is the main aim of uh, my talk, that there are components, they are given by a different uh, relation. Uh, they are as it is shown here, we have the electric field in this direction. The spin current is also in, now in the Z direction. However, the induced polarization is parallel to the E field. Okay, so this here is a tensor element uh, as it is given here uh, with uh, two times the, uh, the X uh, component. This component is time reversal odd. It is not given by a spin Berry curvature. It is given by a spin surface or an intraband uh, term. Okay, so our calculations actually show that this component, which we for which we use the name magnetic spin hole effect, um, following the paper by Kimata et al., this here is actually always present in magnetic materials. Um, there was a, a little bit of a discussion that we had uh, before this talk by email. So there is, what you could see is that there are several papers. They talk about the spin anomalous hole effect. Yeah, they, they, I mentioned them. And there were several works, they, that theory works, that have discussed the spin anomalous hole effect. So this here, what I show here, this is from Amin uh, uh, Lee Stiles and Haney. Uh, and this, this here is from Miura and uh, Matsuda. 
So they, they have calculations, ab initial calculations for the spin anomalous Hall effect. And you can see it here in this plot. What happens is we have the E vector in this direction, spin current in this direction, and then the spin polarization orthonormal to it. So this here is given by this relation. Uh, all the three quantities, they are orthonormal. You can also see this here. This is this tensor element. This here, uh, it is spin hole effect like. It is uh, time reversal even. Yeah? So this is the, the Fermi C term. Uh, we have another term that we are focusing on. L let us do a small symmetry uh, analysis uh, of the spin hall effect. Oh, so, so the uh, spin conductivity tensor here, if I have a non-magnetic material, then I have, they are given by this expression here. I have here the levi civita tensor. And that means I have three, co three possible combinations here, uh, X, Y, and Z, I, and I can do a, a cyclic permutation. They are all the same. If I have a ferromagnet, the, the magnetization axis is going to be break the, the symmetry. And then they are not all the same again. There is an anisotropy here due to the magnetization axis. This is what is called the spin anomalous Hall effect in these papers. And if you go to HCP cobalt, there is a, a structural uh, anisotropy that also comes in. However, if you do a, a symmetry analysis, and I have to refer to this paper here, Zeeman et al., uh, where they showed by, by symmetry analysis, what are the possible elements that are non-zero? And here we, we write the, the tensor elements, two of them, there's also this, the sigma SC. And what you look, what you see when you look at those tensor elements, there are elements here in blue. They are uh, spin hole uh, effect like. They are time reversal even, and they have this Levi Civita property, three different indices. Then there are unusual components here. Uh, they, they have two times here a repeated uh, index. They actually, they are time reversal odd and they depend on the magnetization. So these are the ones we don't use for this, for these components, spin anomalous Hall effect, because that name is already taken for, uh, for the anisotropy here. We used, therefore we use the name magnetic spin Hall effect. Okay, but these elements, they exist. This, this was already shown by, by Zeeman et al. And also recently analyzed by uh, Bong. Now we can go to the results that we have here. So um, uh, iron, cobalt, and nickel. Here we have uh, the spin hole effect like component. And this is the, the, the same one, but now for the orbital conductivity. And this is on this side over here. These are the, the time odd components. So the here time even and here time odd. We use a lifetime here. It uh, is given here the value. So what you can see here, there is indeed magnetic spin, sorry, the spin hall effect. It has a, an anisotropy uh, that is uh, visible here. Also visible is that the orbital hall effect is always much larger than the spin hall effect. Uh, and this was already known in the literature since the Japanese work of 12 years ago. Now the new component, at least for us new, is the magnetic spin hall effect here. There is not much uh, anisotropy, uh, in fact. And also, if we look at these two components here, magnetic uh, spin hall effect and the ma magnetic uh, orbital hall effect, they, they have the same size. Okay, uh, but if you compare spin hall effect and magnetic spin hall effect, actually they are also similarly large. Uh, the magnetic orbital hall effect, however, is smaller than the orbital hall effect. Okay, so these, these curves, how does this now translate if we look at numbers? Uh, so in the previous plot, there was the chemical potential, but now we look at the Fermi energy. So we have the time even components and we have the time odd components for iron, cobalt, and nickel. And in these three here, so in these three, there is this, the spin anomalous Hall effect is in there. It is the anisotropy that we have here. Okay, so what we see here, this anisotropy, and then what we look when we look now at the values here. So the magnetic spin hall effect is actually of the same size almost as the spin hall effect. This means that uh, they have to be taken into account, these uh, components. 
Uh, there was not much work done on these components, but they are there. Um, okay, so the orbital Hall effect is much larger and actually it exists without spin orbit coupling. Um, yes, this one, the magnetic orbital Hall effect is actually a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, important is also that this one here, so it is not given by a Berry curvature expression, but it's given by uh, a Fermi surface expression, um, intraband. It means that if I have very pure samples, this term is going to be become larger. So here is a calculation. This is the dependence on the broadening. You see here that if this, uh, this, this broadening becomes uh, smaller, so longer lifetimes, you get actually uh, larger effects. So they increase quite a bit. Okay, so now we can go on and we can uh, now look at experiments. Uh, so we have, um, we have a spin current, uh, and now we don't want to take the electric field, but we want to take the, the charge current here. So instead of the E here, we have now the inverse of the, the conductivity tensor or the the resistivity tensor. And then we can look what is now the, the tensor that we call theta SK, the, the spin charge uh, angle tensor. Now we have two tensors that we have to multiply. So we have this one for the uh, conductivity row, and we have the other tensor uh, uh, sigma uh, SK. So if we do that, uh, this is then the result. Uh, now you actually you can see something interesting. There are many terms now because what happens is that we have those uh, unusual elements. They are actually, for, for example, they are here. Uh, but there are also other elements that come in here. Um, so if we look at this one here, this is the, the normal uh, spin hole effect uh, multiplied with uh, resistivity here. However, there is a second component that enters now. So this is the anomalous Hall effect, uh, and it is uh, multiplied also with uh, an, an unusual, with, with the magnetic spin Hall effect. So this here, they, they come in. So we have a mixing of effects. This one is time reversal even. This one is time reversal odd, but this one is also time reversal odd. So it becomes time reversal even again. We can look at some other, uh, components here. Um, th this is also an interesting one. So this here, this is the, the normal spin hole uh, effect, if you like. But then there is an, uh, an effect due to the uh, anomalous hole effect. Uh, and, and this term here, this actually, this is a spin filtering that happens due to the longitudinal conductivity that is spin dependent. And it is then time odd, the anomalous Hall effect also time odd, but this becomes time even again, and this will mix with this uh, uh, component here. Okay, I don't want to say too much about um, the magnetic spin and orbital Nernst effect in, in view of the time, but you're welcome to, to ask me about it. What we predict is actually that also there is a, a, a new effect, if you want magnetic spin Nernst effect, and it is large. Yeah, it is larger than even the, the normal spin uh, Nernst effect. And also there is a magnetic orbital Nernst effect that we uh, predict. Uh, I want to move on to uh, symmetry um, broken interfaces. So we want to look at uh, spin orbit torque uh, in uh, platinum, and then we have a 3D ferromagnet on top of that. So this is our system here. We have uh, 16 platinum layers, and then we have two layers on top of that with uh, a through 3D uh, metal. It can be nickel, cobalt, or copper, but we also, for, for comparison, we can put two layers of platinum, and then we have just uh, 18 layers of platinum. And we do the same kind of calculation for the, the magnetoelectric susceptibility and the spin current uh, tensor. Now we can also go to torques. Uh, so we can uh, uh, calculate torques. This is the expression for the torque, actually from paper by Freimuth et al., uh, where we have this delta B, which we can uh, rewrite in terms of delta S. And delta S we calculate from the linear response expressions here. 
And, and then we can feed uh, this back in here. So we get here for the, for the torque, this is uh, normalized magnetization uh, times this tensor here. And we can work out because the, the chi has time reversal even and time reversal odd elements. Okay. And this means then when this here is a time reversal even, we get a term like this giving us uh, um, um, a field like torque. And when this here is time reversal odd, I have then two times an M and I, I get then time reversal even damping like torque. So in this way, we can. Uh, start from calculating these quantities and then calculate the torques. Um, so let us look at the induced uh, spin and later on I will go to the orbital polarization. Now we can calculate this layer dependent. So we do this in a layer dependent fashion. Um, and we have now again, actually we have two components. Uh, so this is just for the spin here. Uh, this is this is the um, the, the normal spin hole effect, uh, layer dependence, the spin hole conductivity. This is the spin accumulation that we get. And this here, orange is platinum. And what you see is this is the typical spin accumulation that you expect from the spin hole effect for, for a non-magnetic layer. This, it, therefore it is time even or magnetization even. But if you have those layers on top uh, of the platinum, there is a, a modification here uh, at, uh, at the interface. So this is the kind of conventional term. However, there is also the, the term that is not uh, conventional. So this is this one uh, is the M even, but there's also the M odd term, just as we had it in the same way as for the, for the elemental ferromagnets. And you see here, this is uh, depending on the magnetization. You, we only have this here for nickel and cobalt. There is nothing for platinum or, uh, or copper. Uh, so this here is the, this is again, the magnetic spin hall effect, but this is the, the spin accumulation that we get. That is then uh, time reversal odd, and it exists only uh, for the ma magnetic system. Uh, we can look at sizes. So here we are at 15 and here actually we are also 20. So we have uh, similar sizes. Now we can also look at uh, the, the induced orbital polarization and the orbital accumulation. Uh, here, this is the calculation for the orbital hall effect. What you can see actually it is large. So it is larger than the spin hall effect in the, uh, in the in the platinum layer, for example. Uh, but then if you go to the orbital accumulation, uh, still time even effect, then it is different from platinum. So we don't, do not see in the calculations what is the typical uh, orbit spin accumulation, but the orbital accumulation has a different shape and it is actually also modified by the, uh, by the interface here. Uh, then we can look at the unusual components that are now again magnetization uh, odd. Um, they are also there. They are actually now they are a little bit smaller. So the uh, the induced um, time odd uh, orbital polarization is smaller, but it also uh, exists. Uh, and what what one can verify in calculations is that these two components here, and uh, they are not due to spin orbit coupling. So we, we would have them even without spin orbit coupling. Uh, we can uh, look at the torques. So now we can, the calculations that I had before, they were for a fixed magnetization. Now we can start to sweep the magnetization and look how those components change with the magnetization. And then actually we can also see from that, um, uh, their dependence on the magnetization. So in this here, uh, this example, we take 12 layers of platinum, uh, two layers of cobalt, and we look at the first cobalt layer at the interface and we sweep uh, the M in the basal plane. So we, we change this angle phi. And then you can look at the calculations here. Actually, what you see is that uh, it, it is very accurate. Yeah? These are rather precise uh, sinus and cosinus uh, functions. Uh, but what you also can see here is that there is a, there are uh, elements, they have a, 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 a two phi, sin two phi behavior. 
uh, well, there are also other elements. This one, for example, this is just sin phi. Uh, and then you can look again uh, at, the, at this product here, uh, looking at uh, the symmetry here, looking at the induced uh, spin polarization, how it depends on the direction of M. And then you, you can see here that there is the, the ones that have, uh, where the, the chi uh, is even in M. Uh, I will have a field-like torque. And the other ones, they are going to give me uh, a damping-like uh, torque. Uh, we can also look at uh, the induced orbital polarization. How does that depend on the magnetization direction? Uh, here now, we, we, for example, we, take, um, we look at the magnetization and we vary it in the zx plane. So we have the angle theta here that we are varying. Uh, and this here, this part, this is for the spin, this column. There are more columns, but I cut it off. But, and this here, this is the orbital susceptibility. So this is the full tensor, how it changes uh, with the uh, changing the magnetization. Um, by changing the angle theta. Okay, here again, one can see the, the uh, typical behavior, actually, this here, this, this, is, uh, this is magnetization odd. Um, what is also interesting here is that the orbital uh, susceptibility, this, this off-diagonal element here, this is very large, uh, and it is uh, uh, almost uh, independent of the magnetization here. So this is the, the largest element that we have. Uh, it is due to a non-relativistic um, effect, or it is, it is just non-relativistic. And, and what one can show that is that it is uh, anti-symmetric uh, if one interchanges the X and Y. Um, so these two elements, they are not due to spin-orbit coupling, but all other elements, they are due to spin-orbit coupling. Okay, so uh, we can look also uh, how now the torques evolve uh, if we look uh, layer specific. So now we have we have the, the actually we have all the elements in a layer specific manner. Yeah, and we can also look at the, the torques now in a layer specific manner. Uh, and this is an uh, example here. Uh, so we look at the, the three. Uh, uh, mono layer, so the, the platinum mono layer close to the interface, then the, the first cobalt layer or nickel layer here, and then the cobalt or nickel that is uh, at the vacuum. And then it is, we can look at the, the size of the element here. So if this, this the value uh, is approximately one, then this, this element can be neglected. And then actually uh, we have uh, this element is time even, which makes then the torque time odd. And this is then the calculation here. Actually, we vary the number of platinum mono layers also to see how that changes. But but when we have around ten platinum mono layers, it is uh, it, it is uh, uh, converged, or how to say it is it it, it does not change much more more. Uh, so what we see here, um, if we look at the platinum here, close to the closest to the interface, so the odd torque is larger than the even torque. Uh, if we go to the the layer, uh, the magnetic cobalt or nickel at the interface, then actually the odd and even they are uh, torques they are ab about the same uh, size, and then we can look at uh, the cobalt or nickel layer at the vacuum. Uh, interface there, uh, actually the even torque uh, is becoming larger. However, we have to say that all the calculations, they depend on the lifetime that we use here. Uh, so, um, and especially since this uh, chi xy uh, is an intraband uh, uh, or a, a Fermi surface term, it will increase uh, for smaller lifetimes or uh, if I have uh, very clean systems. Now I want to move on and go to the uh, symmetry broken antiferromagnets that I mentioned in the beginning. So there was this paper by Wadley et al. Science 2016, where they used current pulses and they had the material uh, copper manganese arsenide and they were doing pulses and then they could see the switching given by, by these uh, changing 
of the um, uh, the perpendicular uh, resistivity. Uh, and this here, the, the mechanism that was proposed in this paper is that there are staggered spin orbit torques. Uh, so they, they were uh, already, already before uh, Wadley et al. They were uh, proposed in this uh, paper by Jakub Selesny, 2014, uh, that if I have these materials uh, with reduced uh, symmetry, actually the current is going to induce uh, a staggered uh, spin polarization on the two, in this case, manganese A and manganese B sublattices, and they point in different directions, and they are going to exert a staggered torque, and they will switch the, the magnetization around. So this was actually also uh, seen for another material, manganese to gold in this uh, work by Botnar et al, Nature Communications uh, 2018. Sometimes one sees that there, one needs to do many steps in order to switch, but, but it apparently it works. Uh, so we wanted to understand this and we use now the same uh, methodology uh, that we calculate for these materials. Uh, uh, the induced spin polarization, so the, the due to the now the spin Raspa Edelstein effect because of the uh, broken symmetry, and also we calculate the orbital Raspa Edelstein effect. Here we look at uh, in, in this plot uh, for um, copper manganese arsenide, where we have the moments along the c axis. So we have two manganese sublattices. Uh, they have uh, the equilibrium moments um, along the c-axis, and then we calculate what are the induced moments. These are the green ones here for a certain uh, applied electric field. Okay, so um, we do this for the spin and the orbital part, and it is actually um, interesting that also now, if you look at the, the tensor, uh, chi, there are elements uh, that were um, not considered before. So there are elements that are staggered or the off diagonal elements, they give a staggered response. So I have to explain a little bit what is in these plots here. This here, these plots here, this, this is the, the two times the chi s and these plots, they are the, the chi l, so the orbital Raspa Edelstein effect. Uh, and what we do here, we also introduce now a frequency. So we can also do frequency dependence. And then we look at uh, all the elements. So we pr project on the atoms in the unit cell. Uh, the, the main thing is to look at manganese one and manganese two. And if you look at these off diagonal tensor elements, they are uh, anti-symmetric. So it means actually that th this is staggered. So manganese one is precisely uh, mi the minus of manganese two. And this we see here, uh, it does not matter if it is x, y, or y, x. Um, if we go to the, the orbital elements, so that were not considered before, but what we find now is that actually these elements, they are much larger than the, the spin elements. So the spin Raspa Edelstein effect here is much smaller than the orbital Raspa Edelstein effect. But these two, they give staggered responses uh, on the manganese one and the manganese two sublattices. However, if you calculate the full chi tensor, you see that there are actually also unusual tensor elements and, and they are not staggered. So here, uh, manganese one and manganese two, they are on top of each other. So they give a non-staggered response uh, that sometimes actually can also be large. Yeah, you see these uh, these two here. They are of the of the same size uh, as the the staggered response. Uh, but the, the this orbital response this is always the largest one. Okay, now what do do these plots mean? Uh, this here here we look at one manganese at atom manganese one, and we change the electric field. So the direction of the electric field is changed. And what you see then is that the orbital polarization, the induced orbital polarization is always uh, normal perpendicular to the uh, applied electric field. And that is because this term is so large. Uh, if we go to the spin, it is different. We have an applied electric field and we can change it around uh, over 360 degrees uh, here. 
Uh, it is not perpendicular, but it is at some angle. And, and the reason that it is at some angle is because I have a staggered response and I have a non-staggered response. So they, they come together and they give them um, uh, here this, this uh, direction, which is not uh, perpendicular. Okay, we can uh, look at manganese to gold. This may be a nice example where we, for uh, in this case, we take for example the, the, the moments along uh, the, the A axis. So the equilibrium moments, they are along the A axis. Uh, we have a different crystal structure, but also inversion symmetry breaking on the manganese atoms. Um, now we can do the same calculation. Um, now, since the magnetization is in the basal plane, we have different uh, elements now that, uh, that we are seeing. Uh, but the, the main message is I have non-staggered elements and I have uh, uh, staggered elements. Here we have precisely opposite uh, induced uh, polarization, spin or orbital polarization on the two manganese atoms. Uh, but not here. So here, the two manganese atoms for the, 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 the non-staggered component, they point in the same direction. Um, if you then look now, what is now the, the symmetry of the induced spin or orbital um, polarizations, depending on the direction of the electric field. Now you see again, the orbital one uh, is almost uh, to a good uh, degree, it is perpendicular. But now, because of the, the elements that I have here, this is no longer the case for the, for the spin. So now we get actually a different kind of symmetry here, which one could call a, a dresser house-like spin response, whereas this one is a Rosba type uh, orbital response. Okay, so uh, interesting is also, let us look for a moment here at gold. So the, the yellow line here is gold. Gold is on a, on a site where it is locally having inversion symmetry. If that is the case, the, the response is zero. Now, the response is zero. It needs the, the, the local inversion symmetry breaking. Okay, let me go on. I'm almost there. Um, what we saw here is that we have this non-staggered uh, response here, uh, manganese to gold. And, I'm not sure if this is related to it or not, but in this paper, Nature Materials uh, 2021, uh, what they, they find an unusual effect, they call this the antiferromagnetic spin hole effect. So what they have actually is that uh, they, they, they have a current through manganese to gold, and then they get a certain spin polarization that actually is not the normal type one, but it is if you can see here, it is pointing out of the, the plane here. Um, and so they, they observe this um, and notice that it is different. Uh, it might be, it might be if I go back here, that actually this here is this non-staggered response because the, the two manganese uh, atoms, they have, uh, they have a spin polarization pointing uh, out of the plane here uh, in, in the same direction. So it, is, it might be related to this. Uh, what they showed is that you can use this for a field-free switching. Okay, the time is almost uh, over. Let me briefly mention that one can do a, a symmetry analysis. And you can look at the origin of the, the tensor elements in this Rashba edelstein tensor. Uh, for simplicity here, we, we take M, uh, so the, the quantization axis along the, the Z axis. And then we have, uh, we have the, the, the tensor for the induced spin polarization, tensor for the induced orbital polarization. And you see here elements, uh, uh, diagonal elements, uh, and we have off diagonal elements. And also here we have off diagonal elements. Um, and what we can, uh, analyze is that if I have those diagonal elements, so they are the, giving the non-staggered uh, uh, response, um, we can show that they are due to uh, uh, spin orbit coupling, they require spin orbit coupling, they are actually due to magnetism, they are the, the time reversal odd elements, they are on the diagonal, um, they, they, they do not sum to zero over the whole unit cell, 
Uh, however, if we look at the off diagonal elements, they are the staggered ones. Uh, if I take the, uh, the, the black ones here, these are the induced uh, orbital polarizations. Uh, this is not uh, does not require uh, any uh, spin orbit coupling. It does not require any magnet magnetism. It is T even. Uh, the the um, these off diagonal elements they are uh, staggered and they sum to zero over the whole unit cell. Okay, so we can precisely say from which part they come and from which uh, term in the um, linear response. Uh, expression. Okay, so let me go to the summary. Um, it is almost time for the for the ferromagnetic iron, cobalt, and nickel. Um, we could show that there is actually a very large magnetic spin Hall effect and also a magnetic orbital Hall effect that was not dis discussed before, uh, and they they are uh, time reversal odds. So we predict these uh, elements. Uh, they are to, expected to be present also in other magnetic materials, and they can actually lead to other effects like magnetic spin Nernst effect and magnetic orbital Nernst effect not observed so far. If you go to the, the platinum 3D the bilayer, um, we have seen that we have a, a time reversal, time res sorry. Uh, time reversal even and time reversal odd, uh, spin and orbital accumulations that lead to different torques, um, and that the orbital accumulation is actually quite different from the spin accumulation. Uh, for the symmetry broken antiferromagnets, um, there is a very large orbital Raspar Edelstein effect that is actually dominant, uh, and it is not due to spin orbit coupling, but giving a, a large orbital polarization. And there exist also um, non-staggered, so they, they are not uh, non, they are not Niel type uh, tensor elements. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Peter, for this interesting talk. Uh, you can use the reactions buttons to uh, to thank uh, Peter. Um, we can take questions now. Please uh, use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Or if you're watching on Twitch, you can just type in your question in the chat box. So um, Vivek, please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I, have, I have a question and I have a comment. Uh, yes, so yes, please. Is, uh, in your calculations, you mentioned you had uh, two relaxation times for the inter and the intraband yeah. uh, contributions. Uh, so mm -hmm. my question is, uh, do you only have two? Are they spin dependent at all? Or are you using the same relaxation time regardless? Okay, um, yes. Um, that is a good question. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Um, here, we, we are talking about uh, two relaxation times. Uh, and in the for the antiferromagnets, actually, what we did is that um, we were uh, calculating. I did not show it. We calculate the longitudinal conductivity, and then we we kind of adjusted these two uh, relaxation times to get the experimental longitudinal conductivity. So they, they were different. Uh, in the calculation that we had, for example. Um, um, here or here, actually we used only one lifetime. Okay, so if you are going to change the lifetime and if you change between interband and intraband, you will get a difference. So that, that is going to happen. Uh, in, in principle, we can calculate it. It, it, it uh, is possible uh, to be done. Uh, I think you also wanted to, to ask about the spin dependence. Yeah, so is there a spin dependent? It seems like you've answered that question already. Uh, the, the answer is that uh, in, uh, in the calculation here, we did not make tau uh, spin dependent. So, the, so uh, and I, I know what you mean uh, because it is known that the relaxation times, they can be spin dependent. So that, that is going to give a difference. 
I have to say that I don't know uh, what the difference is going to be, but I, I presume that you're about to calculate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can also calculate it. Uh, sure. it, it is possible. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. And so so it is, it, we, we don't know how important that is going to be. Uh, but but um, what we, one has to say, maybe Vivek, if, uh, so you have you, you would have different numbers for spin up and spin down, yeah, different relaxation times. But um, you know you now now you go from from pure to impure material, and they are going to change a lot. Yeah, so there will be a dependence, and and then the question is if the maybe the uh, uh, the purity of the sample is more important than than the spin dependence uh, of of the uh, of the lifetimes. Okay, yeah, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment. So I, actually, I have calculated um, the dependence on the difference in the spin dependent lifetimes, and we do find that there is um, that does play a role, and we can talk about that more later. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is that uh, you did a nice job of. Um, distinguishing the spin anomalous Hall effect from the magnetic spin Hall effect. Obviously one is time reversal even, one is odd, Fermi surface terms versus Fermi C terms. I uh, just wanna make a comment that um, in a paper that I was involved with earlier, we calculated interface generated spin currents. Yeah. And in that same paper, we did also look at the time reversal odd Fermi surface contributions um, to what you're referring to as the magnetic uh, spin Hall effect in cobalt. Um, so I just yeah yeah that, uh, make yes sure. yes yeah. we, we we were uh, looking at your paper and uh, so uh, of course it has to be mentioned uh, properly I, I agree with that um, yeah th there is one plot and but maybe we should not take the time now to discuss it because uh, there is one element you, you calculate one magnetic element that is that is not zero. Uh, but but if you so there is a difference yeah there's a difference okay let me see here um maybe i wonder where to, what is the best um, right okay so um um what i want to say is that you you find one element that is non zero but we have several elements that are non zero yeah, for cobalt. Okay. So, so I, I, I have not completely understood it, but but I, I, I completely respect your point that you want to say that there was a calculation there. Yeah. We can we can maybe talk about it more later. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, further questions, please. Just use your raise hand feature. Um, Tom Sanderson, please go ahead. Oh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the really nice talk. Uh, I just really wanted to know, um, I was curious how, uh, so what, if spin orbit coupling is not the thing that is uh, required to generate large orbital currents, Hmm. Uh, what are the kind of ingredients to generate large orbital currents? Um, yeah, maybe yeah. I, I have to look what is a, a good place uh, in my talk to show this. Um, okay, so um, so what we did is that uh, in the uh, in the paper, let me just see if that um, on the antiferromagnets. Yeah, okay. Uh, it was this paper here. Uh, what we do is that uh, we show um, that there is an expression, uh, which I did not write here, uh, but it is, uh, uh, you can show that there is a, an expression, uh, just an operator expression, dl dt is equal to r cross e. Sorry, mm -hmm. that, that, sorry, okay. This is a non-relativistic expression. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there is no relativity activity in there and so you you can see that uh, the induced orbital moment you can have it without relativity is possible uh, and if you work out that expression so i would want to refer to the the paper here but uh, 
if you work out that expression uh, between states, then you can also show if there is a certain symmetry between the, the manganese atoms. Uh, so uh, then you actually, you will get uh, precisely an induced moment on one uh, manganese atom and an induced moment that is anti-parallel on the other manganese atom. So you, it is possible to show this from a non-relativistic expression. Okay, great. So yeah, it, it is a good question. And actually, uh, yeah. uh, f f so what, what I think is that uh, we should maybe start to think more uh, about um, induced orbital polarization as, as a fundamental effect. And on that if we now have spin orbit coupling on top of that, uh, then we will get the induced spin polarization. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, so how how does that how um, if you have, for example, large uh, hybridizations between different orbitals, does that lead more likely to uh, to larger orbital currents, or or is it is it something else that I'm I'm maybe missing that you need to, okay. to actually? Do, for, hey, we're forgetting about spin orbit coupling. How how do we mm. make a big orbital current? Yeah. Um. There is one paper that I did not discuss in view of the time, but, but if you go to the abstract, so we calculated for 40 elements, we can, or I have to say Leandro Salemi did it, but we calculated for 40 elements, uh, the spin Hall effect, the orbital Hall effect, and then spin Nernst effect and orbital Nernst effect. And I did not put that in. Uh, but then you can see where you get uh, a large uh, orbital hall effect. Uh, and this, this you can already get for 3D elements. Yeah, so even light 3D elements, they can already give you a big effect. So there is no need uh, to go to, um, to 5D elements, platinum, um, tantalum, and so on. Uh, you can, with, with light 3D elements, you can create a large orbital hall effect. Uh, yeah, okay, so it, but it, it depends on the, uh, the electronic structure. Uh, and in that paper, it is also shown that you need actually D electrons. Because if you go to uh, aluminum, yeah. aluminum is, is a light metal, but has no D electrons. And then the, we get that the orbital Hall effect is not predicted to be large. Okay. Right. Ah, interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, further questions? Let me ask you something, Peter. Um, so it's about the uh, methodology of these linear response uh, calculations. Yeah. So in the phenomenological description of um, spin transport, we, we usually use the spin diffusion theory. Mm -hmm. Right, and spin diffusion requires that there is disorder. Yeah. And in these calculations, there is no disorder. There's just broadening. Um, and it's well known that diffusion sits in other diagrams, right? It's in the latter diagrams, essentially. So mm -hmm. what is the relation between this kind of linear response calculation and spin diffusion theory? Yeah, okay, so, so um, that is a, a, a difficult question, uh, Kirill. Uh, so basically what happens then, uh, one would need to go to vertex corrections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they would need to, need to come in here. Um, maybe some people have looked at that. We have not done it. Um, um, it so at the moment I cannot say um, how important th that is going to be. Um, it, it might play a role, uh, certainly for the size of the effects. Uh, I think that what we have in the symmetry analysis, that is not going to change. So, so that is going to, to stay. Um, maybe, but sizes, uh, th they can be different. Um, maybe you know, better than I know what, what the effect of the vertex corrections is going to be. Well, so, I'm rather 
asking uh, less about the magnitudes of, of uh, some integrated qu uh, quantities. But for example, you were showing a picture that uh, had the uh, um, distribution of the spin accumulation across the thickness of the film. Yeah, let's right. go there. Yeah. So the spin diffusion predicts some profile. Yes, and yes. calculation yeah. also predicts a profile. This kind of looks yeah. that kind of looks similar. Yeah, but Just should it really? Right? Is it? Is it? Is it a real uh, coincidence? Uh, I mean, is it agreement or is it coincidence? Hmm. Because I mean, okay. there is no diffusion in in, in the theory. So okay. should it? Um, yes, it, it's a good question. Um, so the, the the spin diffusion. Um, is also done in several models and they give actually the type that was shown here so mm -hmm. they give this this shape here uh, this here this is ab initio now one might try to find uh, and i think actually that there are going to be differences yeah so the because really here the the element the mono layer at the uh, vacuum interface is going to be somewhat different. So th there is a small difference. Um, I'm not sure if that has been analyzed. Actually, um, we, we could do a calculation with uh, spin diffusion uh, and then try to plot that on top of this. Uh, so that might be possible. Yeah. I see. Of course, you, you do expect, you know, atomistic stuff going right at the interface. But suppose you take a th thick film of a normal metal. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah, okay. uh, in the diffusive regime, you should agree with diffusion theory. So I don't know whether mm -hmm. this calculation will agree with it and should it agree. I do know if I do the uh, non-equilibrium Green's function calculation with disorder that it does agree. Okay. The large thickness, and you can fit it to, to, to the spin diffusion solutions. But what happens here with this linear response, I just don't know. Okay, so, so the shape looks similar. Uh, I think we agree on that. Uh, but th there might be um, differences in details. Yeah, so that is... Um, that I think here different. it may be a little hard to say because you essentially have a straight line in the middle. The, the, this film is a bit too thin, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, right. So um, um, we could do thicker films. That is uh, possible, but it, it, will be, um, it will be a big calculation, but uh, it, it might be possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. So so there uh, one, one could uh, indeed learn more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shen, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter, for the uh, great talk. Uh, I just have one clarification question. Uh, when you show that the, the spin hall effect in the uh, iron cobalt nickel, they are highly anisotropic. Uh, I just want to ask the the uh, notation uh, in this in this calculation. Sx is the spin direction, and why? So the the, for the, the first the conductivity I'm looking at. What is the uh, y direction? What is z direction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was actually here, but um, um, and now I have to see here the. Um, uh, the, the magnetization is in the in the z direction. Magnetization is in z. Yeah, uh, and then you can uh, calculate the, the different elements. But if you look at them, you can also do uh, you can also make a permutation. Basically, you can also think of magnetization in plane, but then you would have right. an, 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 right. another element. Right. So, but, but, but I, it is it is uh, it is identical. I see. Uh, just naively speaking, I thought there are only two different. Uh, conductivity uh, elements, but there are three, so okay, I want to okay. ask. Uh, if you take iron or nickel, yeah. then there are two that are almost the same. Uh -huh. Yeah, two, two that are almost the same, uh, but, but one is really different. I see, but cobalt, all three are different. 
because we have the the crystal symmetry break. Oh, I see. So yeah, cobalt, this is HCP. HCP cobalt, yes. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, that, that's all my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else has a question? Doesn't look like it. So um, let's thank Peter again for this very interesting talk.